actually took the risk free rate wrong uh, in this second question basically because I there's no good reason so you got the risk free rate wrong so. yeah, because uh, three percent plus so that's so that's one point off right yeah there. yeah but the, uh, but same risk free rate I use Doesn't, here but then so you also have your equity risk premium is wrong right no uh, according to the sheet it seems uh, it's on the other side it comes out to be correct what is the 7.5 so uh, is that the, this I added the CDS spread to RF to calculate the RF. So you got two risk free rates wrong. Both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me t let me take a look. Take take a copy. I might I I'll give you a half or one point back. Okay. Hello. Hello. What? You can use that mic. It's live. It is. Hello. No. Hello, good morning. Hi everyone. Really quickly, before we start, um, if you don't know me, my name's Gabe, I'm an MBA one. Uh, I hope you all remember this, uh, this YouTube video that we saw, I think, during launch. Hit it! Of uh, many of our friends on spring break treks. Yep, exactly, from Follies. Also non-Trek content, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be producing this video uh, this year. It's gonna play in Follies, and it's also used uh, by the administration. So I just want to have a quick word with you about content. If you would like to submit some, keep in mind you do not have to be on an official Trek to submit content. Uh, what kind of content are we looking for? Really, honestly, anything. Going down roads is great. Things like buckling your seatbelts, packing your suitcases, B-roll kind of stuff, drinking general fun having, um, posing and jumping is always good. Panoramas, people helping each other is always warm and fuzzy and honestly, you know, anything. Um, pictures and video is great. Now, one really important thing, if you want your content included. I know many of you, including me, take pictures with your phones held vertically like this. Now, when you do that, you get pictures that look like this. That would be great if our eyes were stacked vertically on our head like this. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have eyes horizontally like this, which means TV screens, movie theaters, etc., are all made like this. Okay? So when you take a video that's, hor that's vertical and put it on a screen made for humans, it ends up looking like this. And nobody wants to see this. Yeah. So please, 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 please hold your phones like this <laughs> if you want your video included. Thank you very much. Send it to me after. Okay, can you hear me? No? I think I've created a log jam with the elevators by telling you your quizzes are out because I saw like 50 people waiting for them. So hopefully if you got there, you're gonna be back in time. Couple of things, I don't know how many years Stern Follies has been going on but some of my most embarrassing moments have been captured on video on Stern Follies. My kids never let me forget it. Hey? I'll give you my least favorite moments of all time. They made me wear an Afro wig and do the John Travolta, you know the John Travolta walk from Saturday Night Live? 
I had to do it from the school. To the, there used to be a place called Polyesters down the street, which used to be the, the 80s, 70s, I don't know, some. So I had to walk all the way down wearing an Afro wig and doing the John Travolta walk. <laughs> and that, I, I, thankfully, I don't think that made it on YouTube. Yeah, it was too early. Then I was crouching tiger, crouching dragon. Remember that, that movie that came out? I had to do this. And then I had to do the Justin Bieber. Yeah. That's actually on YouTube. Don't go look for it, because my kids do it all the time. And they show it to each other just to laugh. Right? So hopefully I will not have to do anything embarrassing. This looks like you've got your internal embarrassments to deal with. So this year, I might be off the hook. A couple of things about the quiz. If you've picked up the quiz, you can check the distribution. You can check the Excel spreadsheet, which has the solutions, the template. I've tried to be pretty, I mean, I was grading them all on the Amtrak train. And it's really tough to do anything on an Amtrak train. It's just so incredibly rocky. Okay? So uh, if, you're, if it looks like I'm scribbling all over, it's because the train took a lurch. And I just know it. And if it looks like I took off three points when it doesn't look like I did, the train probably made me put minus three. So I think I've been pretty consistent. But if there's a screw up on your quiz, bring it to me. Don't take it to Luis or Miguel. They have nothing to do with this. Okay? So it's not their problem. Bring it to me, and I'll fix it. Okay? On the multiple choice questions, I'm willing to listen. So if you have an answer that you think is the right one, and you're stuck on that answer, you can come in and convince me otherwise. And if you can convince me otherwise, I'll give you the half point. It's amazing what people do for a half a point. <laughs> one year. One year, I actually said, if you can find documented research to back up your answer, I will give you a half point back. People showed up with chiefs of PDF files that printed off. Hey, I said, this is worth half a point. I made you do research on things you wouldn't even have looked at, like corporate governance. Right? So here's my advice, though. If you did badly, let it go. It's over, right? There's, and remember, you get that one freebie. If you did well, well, let it go, because it's only 10%. So basically, the quiz has changed nothing. Okay? It's not like you're in a better place or a worse place today in terms of grades than you were five days ago. You might feel better about yourself. That's good, because that'll make it easier for the next quiz. But no, it's not going to make or break your grade. So it's, it's something, as we go through, things will start to get more consequential. But for the moment, this was just your, the reason I do the quiz as early as I do is because if I wait till the actual middle of the term, that's going to be the end of March, early April. And by the time you find out you're in trouble, it's too late. That's part of the reason I went to three quizzes, because you, know, you need to get an early signal if things are not connecting. And hopefully, you got a good signal out of this. But if you got a bad signal, I'll send you something that you might be able to do that can help you through the process. So let's pick up where we left off on, was it Monday? It was Monday, I guess. We were talking about the cost of debt. Let me back up, though. What did I say? What are the three criteria I said you should look for in debt? Somebody help me out. Yulia, since I now know your name, I'm going to pick on you. Okay? <laughs> what are the three criteria? Um, it needs to be tax. Tax deductible is one. That's actually the one criteria you might actually not need in some parts of the world, but tax deductible in most of the world. What do you think? Contractual commitment, excellent, that's good. And if you don't make that payment, there's punishment. Or not punishment, something bad happens to you. Fixed payment, tax reduction, and we said using those criteria, looking at a balance sheet, the items that automatically make the list are all interest-bearing debt. Bank loans, corporate bonds, short term as well as long term. And we said any kind of contractual commitment, like a lease commitment, should be debt. I did not talk about what would not be debt. So let's look at a balance sheet. We talked about what should be debt. What else is on the liability side of the balance sheet that, I, that would not be debt? Then? Accounts payable, supplier credit, deferred this, deferred that. None of that stuff is going to be debt. Why? Not because you don't owe the money, but because you don't have an explicit interest payment. Think about accounts payable. How does it work? You buy stuff from a supplier. He says, you can pay me right now, wait 60 days, right? But he's not stupid. To get you to pay right now, what does he offer? A usually a discount. 
So when you use accounts payable, you have an implicit interest expense, but because it's not made explicit, we're going to leave accounts payable alone. Doesn't mean it doesn't affect us in corporate finance. It affects your cash flow through working capital, but it will not show up as debt. And the final thing I said before the end of the class was we need a cost of debt. And I told you what I was going to look for. I needed a cost of borrowing money long term today. And I said, I don't care whether you have short term debt or long term debt. I'm going to bundle it all up and I'm going to try to estimate a cost of borrowing money today. Which effectively means I'm going to start with the risk free rate and try to estimate a default spread for you as a company. So let's start easy in terms of estimating default spreads and build up the ladder. The easiest companies to estimate a default spread, we can get an updated cost, are companies that are bonds outstanding. Why? Because when you have bonds outstanding that are traded, let me add that qualifier, because a lot of companies have bonds that never trade. They go into somebody's portfolio and they stay in there for the rest of the until maturity. But if they're traded, what can I observe? I can observe the price on the bond and the yield to maturity on the bond, right? So if you're a company that has bonds outstanding, this seems like an easy solution. Take a bond. Look up the interest rate, the yield to maturity in the bond, use that as your cost of debt. I'll tell you that while that is an easy solution, it's a very dangerous one, and here's why. Can a risky company issue a safe bond? Yes, right? And how would it do it? It basically takes its safest assets and backs up the bond with those safest assets. That's why if you look at ratings agencies, ratings agencies rate both the company and the bond. And you can have, actually have different ratings. You can have a single A-rated company issue a double A-rated bond, or vice versa. The danger of focusing on a bond and a yield to maturity is you have no idea whether you're catching a typical bond, a safe bond, or a risky bond. But if you do have bonds outstanding, you get a bonus. What do most companies with bonds outstanding also have available on them that you could use to estimate how much default risk they have on them? They have a corporate rating. Do you, actually, let me step back. Are you required to get a bond rating to issue a corporate bond? It's actually not required, but almost every company does it. You think, why should I, I'm going to break the mold as a company. I'm going to issue bonds and refuse to get rated. No, you can. But what do you think will happen? Investors will look at your guy and say, why did this guy refuse to get rated? They will assume the worst about you. So in a sense, it is in your best interest to get that rating. And S&P, Moody's, et cetera, et cetera, they're like, and in fact, this has now gone global. You've got ratings agencies that are country specific that do that within the country, attach a rating, and it's a letter grade. And S&P and Moody's, it goes from AAA, which basically means you're the safest corporation. It's not default free for corporations, because with corporations, there's always default risk, but AAA is as close to safe as you can get going all the way down to D, which is you're in default. So it goes AAA, AA, and you have pluses, minuses, et cetera. So you've got a whole layer of ratings. You think, how does it help me? If you know your company has a triple B rating, I can guess what kind of default spread you will be paying. And here's why. There are other triple B rated bonds that are traded out there. In fact, there are, I think Merrill Lynch has these funds which are invested only in triple B, double B, single B. And you can see what the current yield is and the default spread is for that, that rating by looking at that index. So it's not just one bond, it's hundreds of triple B bonds. And let's say right now triple B rated bonds trade at 2% above the T bond rate. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you, the risk-free rate today. I'm going to add 2% to it on the assumption that if you're triple, a ra triple B rated, your cost of debt should be that of a tr typical triple B rated company. So if you have a rating, again, I'm home free because I can use that to come up with a default spread. That takes care of about 10% of all companies around the world, which leaves you with the remaining 90% where there are no bonds and no ratings. So you say, how the heck do they borrow? How do they borrow? How do most companies around the world borrow? They go to a bank and they take a bank loan. That's still the prevailing way, at least outside the US. And even within the US, if you get past the large market cap companies, the way companies borrow is from the bank. You think, that's good. I can look up the interest rate on the loan. When can you get away using that as your cost of debt? What, is, what has to be true about the loan, for the interest rate on the loan to be a cost of debt today? It has to be a loan you took today, or maybe yesterday. 
But it cannot be a loan that you took two years ago or five years ago. Why? Because things have changed, right? Interest rates have changed, your default risk has changed. You cannot use a book interest rate as your cost of debt because I have no idea what it's telling me. So most people, when they run into this problem, take what I think is the easy way out. They say, I cannot find a rating or a bond, therefore I'm going to use the book interest rate as my cost of debt. Don't go down that road. Here's what you need to do. You need to act like a ratings agency. You think that's going to be complicated. Luckily for us, ratings agencies are extraordinarily transparent organizations, not because they want to be, but because of the output they provide us. What do you get as output from a ratings agency? They get you the rating for every company they rate, and they give away the game. They give you the eight ratios they use to compute that rating. You go to the, in fact, it used to be on the front page of the S&P ratings uh, website, is the eight ratios, EBITDA to fixed charges, EBIT to interest expenses. So here's what they're telling you. We use these eight ratios to come up with the rating. We, don't, we won't tell you how we use the ratings, but by the way, here's the output, the ratings. When I first embarked on this mission of trying to be a ratings agency, I said I'll do some reverse engineering. I took every rated company, I took all eight ratios they claim to use, and then I sorted the Excel spreadsheet based on rating from AAA down to single C to see if I could look, find a pattern. Sounds complicated, right? Basically, I, took a, I, I remembered my statistics and did a correlation between each ratio and the rating. First to find out, which ratios were doing the heavy lifting and which ones were along just for the right? You think, why would you throw in a ratio that doesn't do much? If you're a ratings agency, you want to create noise in the process, right? You want to make it look like you're doing complicated stuff when you're not. This is true for consulting. For Basically, you can't tell people, this is what I do. You've got to create all this noise around to make it look like you're doing all this other stuff. Unfortunately for ratings agencies, the noise doesn't work because they've given away too much. And what I discovered when I looked across the eight ratios is one ratio seemed to be doing the bulk of the work, at least for non-financial service companies. Financial service companies are very different games, so let's keep them out of the picture for the moment. Non-financial service firms, the ratio that worked the best in explaining differences in ratings across companies is called the interest coverage ratio. You know what the interest coverage ratio is? It's operating income divided by interest expense. I'm going to use the interest coverage ratio to guess what the rating for a company is. So let's set up the game. Let's start with our easy companies, at least among my five first. Three of my five companies had actual ratings from S&P. You say, why do you use S&P? I could have used Moody's as well. You, most of the time, the ratings agencies are pretty much in agreement. So in this case, Disney and Deutsche were rated single A. Vale was rated A minus. I could get the default spread based on the rating. So single A rated companies have a default spread of 1%. Notice I've added that default spread to both a US risk-free rate and a Euro risk-free rate. This goes back to what I talked about with risk premiums, is your risk-free rates are not wildly different. You can get away using the same default spread as the risk premiums. If your risk-free rate were 12%, I'd be a little more cautious about doing this. You see why? Because your risk-free rate is 12%, adding a 1% spread might not be enough even if your rating is single A. But here, because I'm talking about euro and dollar risk free rates, I've added the 1%. I've come up with a cost of debt of 3.75% for Disney and 2.75% for Deutsche Bank. For Vale, the rating was A minus. The spread that goes with an A minus rated bond is about 1.3%. I come up with a cost of debt pre tax of 4.05% in US dollar terms. Why? Because I'm working in US dollar terms all the way through. You've got to be consistent. Once you make your currency choice, you've got to stay with that. Yes? For uh, banks, the yeah. major uh, loans are provided by the depositors. Yeah, I'd, I'd be very careful. Defining debt for a bank is like trying to nail jello to a wall. <laughs> it's almost impossible to do because, as you said, deposits are, in a sense, debt, right? They meet all the requirements for debt. The only problem is, if you have a checking account, it's debt without Interest expense. It's a messy process, so I'm just going to leave banks alone. I'm not even going to call it debt. Why? Because debt to a bank is raw material. If I try to define it as a source of capital, these are exactly the kind of problems I'm going to tell, what the heck do I do now? So with non-financial service firms, at least we can focus on debt, I have the cost of debt. And again, if you change your mind and decide 
to do Wale's cost of capital in nominal reais, it's easy to do, right? Remember the technique we used? You start with the cost of debt in dollar terms, and you scale it up for the additional inflation. We've done this like five times. By now, I want it to become second nature. If I give you a cost of equity or cost of capital in one currency, and I say, give it in a different currency, you're going to go through that inflation differential and give me that adjustment. In nominal REI terms, Wale's cost of debt will be 11.19% in pre-tax terms. And when I do that, when I do the scaling up, guess what I'm scaling up? Not just the risk-free rate, but I'm also scaling up the default spread. So if I took the risk-free rate in REIs and added 1%, I think I'm going to underestimate the cost of debt. This way, my default spread are going to scale up, at least for high inflation currencies. So if you have a rating, this is the easy way out. And so let me go look at the firms where I don't have a rating. As I said, the ratio I'm going to use is the interest coverage ratio. And remember again why I picked it. I don't think it's a great ratio. I don't think it's the best ratio. I picked it because it works. I have a very simple exercise here. I want to be like a rating agency. So if you are putting this EBITDA to fix charges is better, you can think what you want. I can think what I want. It doesn't really matter, right? Because in this case, my job is to find the ratio that best predicts ratings. So the interest coverage ratio, I take operating income and divide by interest expense. So if I take my five companies, including my private company, Bookscape, and I divide the operating income by the interest expense, I get a range of interest coverage ratios from 4.51 to 22.57. Now I want you to think like a lender. If you're lending to an entity, would you want this interest coverage ratio to be a high number or a low number? You want it to be a high number. Why? Because there's a lot of buffer, right? You got $22.57 of earnings for every dollar of interest expense. You as a lender not lying awake at night saying, will I get paid? So the higher this number, the safer the company. We're on, our, on track now. Because then, if I'm computing a rating, I would expect to see a really high rating go with a high interest coverage ratio, and a really low rating go with a low interest coverage ratio. That's the easy part. Now comes the difficult part. How high a rating? To do this, I went back to my original Excel spreadsheet. Remember the ratings and the eight ratios that I had? I looked at what kind of range of interest coverage ratios typical AAA rated companies, AA rated companies, single A rated companies had, and I created what I call a lookup table. Lookup table in Excel is you give me the interest coverage ratio, I'll guess your rate. I discovered as I was looking across those rated companies, though, that ratings agencies seem to follow two sets of rules. One is if you're a really big company, market cap greater than five billion, and one if you're a smaller company. If you're a larger company, they seem to give you a higher rating for the same interest coverage ratio. You're saying, that's not fair. Hey, life's not fair. That's the way it is. Large companies, if I have an interest coverage ratio greater than 8.5, it looks like you end up with a AAA rating. If your interest coverage ratio is between 6.5 and 8.5, it looks like you get a... So basically, I have a lookup table for large companies. For smaller companies, the standard gets raised. You need an interest coverage ratio of at least 12.5 to get exactly the same AAA rating. I have everything I need. So let's take my five companies and come up with ratings. We're going to call these synthetic ratings. Why? Because we don't want to get sued by Moody's or S&P for masquerading as ratings agencies. Not that I want to. Okay. But synthetic ratings in the sense, I'm making this stuff up. Don't sue me. So let's start with Disney. Interest coverage ratio of 22.57. That's an easy one, right? 22.57. I'm going to go with the AAA rating. Vale has a large market cap. It's greater than $5 billion. It's an emerging market company, though. And with emerging market companies, what I do is I use the small company coverage ratio. Again, it's not fair but you're set to a higher standard if you're an emerging market company. 11.67, if you look at the second column, puts me at a double A rating, so I give them a double A rating. For Tata Motors, which is a large cap company, its market cap exceeded five billion, but still an emerging market company, a 4.51 interest coverage ratio translates into an A minus rating. For Baidu, which is a small cap, less than five billion dollar market cap, emerging market company, 23.72 translates into a triple A rating. And Bookscape, is a really, really small company with an interest coverage ratio of 5.16. Its rating gives, it's, that interest coverage ratio gives me a rating of A minus. You're saying, this is such a simplistic approximation. Conceded. You know why? I'm not a fixed income guy. 
I don't care whether your rating is, this is not about getting the perfect rating, it's being within shouting distance of the actual rating, because your cost of capital, if I give you an A rating instead of a double A rating, is not going to change very much, and I've got to keep that in perspective. For instance, you're looking at Baidu and you're saying, there is no way Baidu will get a AAA rating. I agree. But you know how much debt has? Uh, how much debt Baidu has? It's 3% debt, 97% equity. I've got to keep that in my mind because when I look at you know, technology companies, young companies, they will have debt that I give them a AAA rating. He said, no way. It doesn't matter because that cost of debt is going to get multiplied by 0.03 or 0.05. I'm going to let it go. So I have a synthetic rating for all of my companies based on the interest coverage ratio. Now one of the things I did after I got the synthetic ratings, remember for at least three of these companies had actual ratings. So I was curious about how close I got. Remember we said within shouting distance, how far is shouting distance here? Let's start with Disney. My synthetic rating was triple A. Their actual rating was, double a, was single A. You're saying how, how can you explain that? It's actually pretty easy. I was looking at a really good year for Disney as my base year. The earnings had gone up substantially. I was giving them a AAA rating based on the most recent year. But if you're a sensible lender, you never lend to a company based on what they did last year. You look across time, right? Because you got to cover interest expenses in good times and bad times. So one reason is the fact that they have earnings that go up and down. And if I used to average income over five years, I get a rating closer to single A. I get it like an A plus or a double A. That's the first. The second is ratings agencies have their own sector biases, which is their preconceptions about some sectors being risky and others being safe. So if you're a utility, it's much easier for you to get a triple A because historically ratings agencies have given utilities triple A because they've been pretty stable. But if you're an entertainment company, a technology company, you start off with that bias. So you're an entertainment company, you're a technology company. You know how difficult it was for Apple to get a AAA? Think about it. Are you worried if you've lent money to Apple that you won't be paid back? They have $100 billion in debt outstanding. You think that, that's a lot of money. But what, what else do they have that keeps you sleeping well at night? They have $250 billion in cash. You're not worried, right? But it was like pulling teeth for the ratings agency. But because Apple was a technology company. So in this case, when you look at a rating, it can be different simply because of either historical earnings or because of the sector you're in. Then I took a look at Vale. And Vale, the difference was much wider. I gave them a double A rating, but S&P gave them an A minus rating. And here I think the reason is actually much more direct. Where is Vale incorporated? In Brazil. You have a problem already, right? Because what does the ratings agency see? Brazil then everything else kind of fades into the background. You're a Brazilian company, I want to punish you. I'm going to give you a much lower rating. Remember, I, you know, the, and this is something that the rating agencies actually explicitly used to build into their rating is what was called a sovereign rating ceiling. Does anybody know what that is? It, your rating for a company cannot exceed the rating of the country you're in. It was actually a very unfair rule because if you're a Turkish company, what have I just said? You're stuck at double B, don't try anymore. They've relaxed at least in, 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 in explicit terms that ceiling, but it's still a factor. So that's why Vale's rating is much lower than my synthetic rating. Deutsche had an A rating, I have no way of explaining it or not explaining it. As, as I said, financial service companies, God only knows what goes in the rating. I'll tell you what, it's actually not God only knows. It's regulatory capital, how big you are as a bank. You could build a ratings predictor for Deutsche, but I'm not even going to bother because I don't care about the cost of debt because I'm going to stop at the cost of equity for Deutsche. There is no such thing as cost of capital for a bank because debt is really not a source of capital. So now I'm ready to do my cost of debt. For the three companies that had actual ratings, I just stayed with the ratings. I considered going with the synthetic ratings. There are times where I've actually overridden actual ratings with synthetic ratings, because ratings agencies, like every other part of the market, sometimes get over-optimistic and overrate all companies. Here I decided to go with the, so I have the cost of debt, and I showed you the pre-tax cost of debt. For Bookscape, I have no choice. I have to use a synthetic rating. And that synthetic rating gives me a default spread of 1.3%, 
the cost of debt in dollar terms is 4.05 percent. But now comes the last piece of the puzzle. I have a pre-tax cost of borrowing. But across the world, in much of the world, the tax code is tilted towards debt. In what sense? Interest expenses are tax deductible. So for every dollar you paid in interest expenses, you get a tax saving. And the question is, how much is that tax savings? When you look at companies, there are two different tax rates you will encounter. The one you will see in the financial statements, in capital IQ, and every service, is called an effective tax rate. You know what an effective tax rate is? How many of you use TurboTax for your taxes? And when you're done, TurboTax always pisses me off. Because when, when I'm done, it says, congratulations. First, why are you congratulating me for sending my money to the government? This year, you paid 25.33% of your adjusted gross income in taxes. This is supposed to make me feel good. But you know how they come up with the 25.33%? They take your taxes paid and divide by your adjusted gross income, your taxable income, and say 25.33%. That's called an effective tax rate. That's what companies report. They take the taxable income and they take taxes paid from the income statement. So if you ever want to compute an effective tax rate for your company, you don't have to go look for it. Just take the income statement. Taxes paid divided by taxable income is your effective tax rate. The average effective tax rate for US companies last year was about 16%. That's one tax rate. It's a tax rate you often find for a company. And then there is a marginal tax rate. What's a marginal tax rate? It's a tax rate on your last dollar of income or on the next dollar of income. You think, why would that be different from my effective tax rate? Why would it be different from your effective tax rate? What are the reasons? I definitely didn't pay 25.33% on my last dollar of income. First, it depends on tax bracket. I have the unfortunate experience of living in the highest tax rate country, uh, state in the country, California, which means I start with my federal tax rate which already, I mean, I won't give away my income, but I'm already complaining about the tax rate. So let's say it's 35%. But I'm not done, right? Then I have state taxes and local taxes. So by the time I'm done, I'm probably looking at a 43 or 44% marginal tax rate. For those of you who plan to live in New York, I feel really sorry for you. Because there are people lined up outside your door with all say, I want my share, I want my, the federal government, the state government, the, the city, the, it's only a matter of time before Chelsea comes after you and then your neighborhood comes after you all saying, I want my slice. You very quickly start to climb to a, you will notice this when you get your first paycheck. You think, what the heck happened here? How did I become George Soros? Okay. So your marginal tax rate is 46, 47, 48%. For companies, though, bracket creep is not an issue because you hit the top marginal tax rate very quickly at $2 million. So that can't explain why companies are paying less than the money. It's you know, tax deferral, income in other countries, et cetera, et cetera. So you now have two different tax rates for your company. One is a 15 or 16 percent effective tax rate. The other is the marginal tax rate, which will vary depending on where your company is incorporated. If it's in Ireland, it could be 12%. If it's in Germany, it could be 28%. If it's in Japan, it could be 31%. In the US right now, it's about 25%. 21% the federal tax level, state and local taxes, about 25%. So here's the question I'm going to ask you. To compute my after-tax cost of debt, should I use an effective tax rate or a marginal tax rate? Why marginal? It's the right answer, but why marginal? Jonathan, help me out. Why marginal tax rate? Well, I think the effective tax rates do too, right? Because it depends on which country you're in. Somebody help me out on how interest expenses help me on my taxes. I have a million, I, let's say you have a million dollars in income. If you feel insulted, add an extra zero, add two zeros, whatever makes you feel good, right? You have base income. Let's say you have $100,000 in interest expenses. What happens? You take the million. You subtract out the 100,000, you report taxable income of 900,000, you pay taxes on 900,000. Think about it. Where did you save on your taxes? On the last 100,000, not in the middle, not in the first. Which means that even if you pay only a 25% tax rate across all of your income, on your interest expense, you're saving taxes 
at the marginal tax rate. That's a scary thought, if, again, if you're in New York. But it basically means that if you buy an apartment, you're going to be tempted to use, even if you have the cash to buy the apartment, you're going to be tempted to borrow the money to buy the apartment because you're going to get a 45% tax benefit from your interest expenses. It explains why the people who need the money the least borrow the most. Because in a sense, we've tilted the tax code to make interest expenses even more advantageous the higher your tax rate. Later on, when we talk about capital structure, we'll talk about what 2018 did to tax benefits for U.S. companies. And you can already see what's coming, right? If your tax benefit is a function of your marginal tax rate, the marginal tax rate in the U.S. in 2017 was 40%. The marginal tax rate in 2018 was 25%. You don't need to be a genius. You don't need to do any corporate finance analysis to conclude that essentially over the course of one year, your tax benefits from debt have dropped dramatically. And if you carry this to the next step, if companies have any good sense in them, what should they be starting to do at least? They should be bringing down their debt because debt is no longer as attractive as it used to be. It's, I'm actually l looking at those numbers. Right now, you're not seeing that happen yet, which gives you a sense of how much inertia drives this process. Companies are so set in their ways, they don't even think about why they borrow. It's what they've always done. But there's a reckoning coming here that if they're not careful, it's going to catch up with them sooner rather than later. Yes? Yeah. You could. In fact, the question is, when you walk into a bank, will they charge you more than the 4.0? Because there's no way Bookscape is issuing a bond, right? There's no rating bond. This is my way of estimating. So if you walk into a bank, well, there, there, there's pluses and minuses to being a small borrower. First is, you're right, you're a small borrower, the bank worries about you more. The second is, on the other side, they can collect information from you, monitor you, do things they could not do with a conventional lender. If I'm a bank, I might actually be safer lending to you than to some big company where I have no idea where the money is going. So if you actually look at the cost of borrowing for private companies, it's true there might be a premium over the 4.05% but it depends on where you are in the country, what, how competitive banks are. If there's only one bank in town, you might be stuck. So it's surprisingly good at predicting cost of debt, even for private companies. So I have marginal tax rates for each of my companies. In the case of Bookscape, I, at the time that I did this in 2013, the marginal tax rate in the US was 40%. Their after-tax cost of debt is 2.43. For Disney, I had a marginal tax rate of 36.1%. That sounds oddly precise for a marginal tax rate. But in Disney's financials, they actually, and this is unusual, had a table that, that told you what their marginal tax rate was. It said, this is what we pay at the federal tax level at the marginal income. So that's a 36.1%. For Deutsche, I used a marginal tax, a marginal tax rate of 29.48%. That sounds odd, two decimal points. What happened in Germany is that some kind of tax reform that ended up with this very strange at the margin tax rate of 29.48. And finally, for Vale, I used the Brazilian tax rate, marginal tax rate of 34%. I came up with after tax cost of debt. So, so far, so good. I'm done with four companies. Now, let me turn my attention to Tata Motors. Tata Motors had a rating, but it wasn't from S&P or Moody's in 2013. It was from an Indian ratings agency called Chrysler, which is AA minus. You're saying, why don't you just use the AA minus? Chrysler rates Indian companies relative to each other. So a AAA rated Indian company is basically, this is the safest company you're going to find in India. So if I use the AA minus rating to get a default spread, I'm essentially going to get a default spread that reflects what Chrysler thinks about the company. So here's what I did. I took the default spread based on the AA minus rating. And I said, OK. I know it's not fair, but I'll give you the 0.7%. But then I said, OK, the, if this is a rating for India, I'm going to add the default spread for India to the spread. You see what I'm trying to do? I'm saying, look, if this is relative to other Indian companies, I still have the Indian country risk to cover. So it looks like I'm doing something different. I'm adding a second default spread. But basically, for a synthetic default spread, you've got to bring the country default spread. So if I'm computing the cost of debt for a Turkish company, I'm going to start. Let's say I'm doing it in euros. Help me out there. What's my risk-free rate going to be? The German euro bond rate, which is close to zero, right? 0.3%. That's already freaking you out. 
Then you add the default spread based on the rating. Let's suppose your Turkish company is AAA rated. The default spread is like 0.6%. 0.3 plus 0.6% is 0.9%. You're going to be tempted to stop there. Don't. Because Turkey has a default spread of another 3%, you have to add that country default spread to come up with the cost of debt for the company because it carries two burdens on its shoulder. Yes? No, I, I remember currency is a choice. I can do it in euros, I can do it in lira, I can do it in pesos, I can do it, do it in rubles. So I chose to do it in euros. But if I did it in rubles, I'm sorry, in, li in lira, I would still start with a risk-free rate, which I computed how? I start with the Turkish government bond rate, subtract out the default spread, now I'm adding it back, saying, hey, look, you're going to go to lira, I've got to add the default spread. So either way, you're going to see default spreads pop in, because it is something you have to worry about. That's fine. That's you, so you'll see that in the equity risk premium, not in the, in the default spread. So the default spread kind of focus in on country. There is a point at which maybe you can escape your country default risk, but it's going to be tougher to do with debt than with equity, right? Yeah, I don't disagree with you. I'm saying there is a benefit to having a Turkish, Turkish Airlines, for instance. You get 80% of your revenues in non-lira. It does help you in terms of default risk, but it doesn't help you as much as it would with equity. Because as a when you lend, you're much more constrained by bankruptcy laws in the country. You're constrained. So there are all these other issues that keep your debt benefit lower than your equity benefit. Right? So obviously, the big number you need here is default spreads. And those default spreads are not fixed numbers. They change over time. For January 2019, this is what the default spreads look like relative to 2018, 2007. So you can see even over the, uh, the four years or five years that I have these default spreads that they've changed. What's the message I'm trying to send with this graph? When you're doing the cost of debt for your company in next, day, next week, I know it's not going to happen. Whenever you do it, <laughs> that default spread from January 2019 is already dated, right? And I told you where I get the default spreads. I get them by looking up what the default spread is. And I'll send you the link to, to FRED, which is a Federal Reserve website, where you can look up the Merrill Lynch AAA. So basically, you can get an updated spread as of yesterday. They're always one day behind because they don't do it in real time. They do it at the end of each day. But you can get an updated default spread. And I would strongly suggest use that updated default spread rather than a dated default spread. So. That is the next half of your equation is to come up with the cost of debt for your company. So to do that, you need to start with the risk-free rate. What risk-free rate? You've already made that choice with the cost of equity as to what currency you're working in and the risk-free rate in that. To that, you're going to add a default spread or perhaps two default spreads. Why two default spreads? If you're in an emerging market company. If your company is an actual rating, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Just use it. But still compute the synthetic rating to see if, it, if you're close. Because we're going to actually need the synthetic rating later in this class, so it's good to know what it is. And then look up the marginal tax rate for your country. If you go to my website, I actually, in my, under data, have the marginal tax rates for, I think, 180 countries. I could claim that I did the work. I did not. I stole it from KPMG. KPMG every year updates the country tax rates. They do a great job. And I said, why should I let it go to waste? I give them full credit. I said, these are the KPMG tax rates. Because who the heck wants to go around to 181 countries, read the tax code in the countries, and figure out what the marginal tax rate? I'm glad they do it. But that I, I pulled the numbers, and you can pull them off. So whatever country you're in, you should be able to find the corporate tax rate in that country. Now let's talk about it. I'm sorry. I'm jumping pages here. Couple of things before I leave this cost around. So far, I've talked about debt and equity as your two ways of raising money, right? But sometimes, companies use hybrids. What are hybrids? They're part debt, part equity. They're like werewolves or vampires, right? They, they don't have one role. They just move back and forth. The two most common hybrids you will run into are convertible debt and preferred stock. Convertible debt, basically, you have conventional debt with an option to convert into equity if the price goes up. So if you think about convertible debt, 
the, the debt portion is right there, the straight bond. The conversion option is really equity, so it's debt and equity in the same security. And with convertible debt, my advice is break it up. Break it up into the debt portion, the equity portion, throw the debt in with, in with the rest of debt, throw the, and the, your problem goes away. It's no longer a problem. Preferred stock is a pain in the neck. In the US, preferred stock has no voting rights. It has a fixed dividend. It's really expensive debt. Why expensive debt? What's the advantage of using debt as opposed to preferred stock in the US? Debt has a tax advantage. Interest is tax deductible. Preferred dividends have, so you're saying, why would companies ever issue preferred stock? There are two groups of companies that issue preferred stock. Anybody want to guess what's one? One is financial service companies, especially banks, and why do they issue preferred stock? Because the regulatory authorities treat it as equity when they do the regulatory cap. So they say, look, we're issuing debt, and by the way, while we do it, our regulatory capital ratio. So they're doing it because regulatory capital is a screwed up notion. Because I think it's bad. It's unhealthy for banks to be issuing this preferred stock with large dividends that you have to pay. Per but because the regulatory capital is defined that way, they issue preferred stock. You know what the other group of companies that issues preferred stock is? Really young startups. You're saying, why do they issue preferred stock? What's the advantage of that? It's a tax advantage. And for you to get the tax advantage, what has to be true? You've got to make money. And if you're a money-losing startup, what the heck do you care whether the debt has a tax advantage or not? You might as well call it preferred stock. The VC seem to like to call it preferred stock. It is really debt, but who, it, it really doesn't matter. So if you have preferred stock, you can't throw it in with debt because you don't get the tax advantage. You can't throw it in with equity because it's not equity. So guess what you have to do? You have to create a third component in your cost of capital. You'll have cost of equity times weight of equity, plus after-tax cost of debt times weight of debt, plus cost of preferred stock times weight of preferred stock. You think, oh my god, now we're going to go on another excursion to estimate a cost? Not really. Cost of preferred stock is very simple. Take the preferred dividend, which is a fixed number, divide by the preferred stock price, you get a preferred dividend yield. So if you have a $6 dividend and the stock is trading at $90, 6 divided by 90 gives you 6.67%. You're done. That's your cost of preferred stock. No betas, no default spreads, nothing to estimate. Yes? It might, but I don't think it, from a cost perspective you care that much because it's all about looking at your annualized costs. So if you think about liquidation and an M&A, there might be benefits you get to being one over the other. But from a cost of debt perspective or a cost of preferred stock, I wouldn't really care. No. So now let's talk about the weights to attach. I'm going to lay out a very simple rule and defend it to the end of this class. When you're computing cost of capital, the weights you should use should always be market value weights. As opposed to what? As opposed to book value weights. Half of all companies around the world still use book value weights, and they give the strangest defenses for why this is OK. So I'll list some of the things I've heard about why book value weights. So this is, this, because remember, the CFOs of most companies are what? Where do they come from? What's their background? They're accountants. They love book value. They spend an entire lifetime. Their CPA is all about computing book value, right? right? They're not going to throw that out of the window. They said, I did all this work to get book equity. I need to use it. So here's the first argument you'll hear from CF CFOs as to why book value is better than market value. Book value is more stable than market value. Market value moves all the time. Book value is more stable. Therefore, book value is better. What, ha what part of that statement is true? Book value is absolutely more stable than market value, right? How often does book value change? Only when your accountant comes to visit you. Have you noticed that? Book value stays fixed until the accountant comes along. So for, U for a US company, book value is going to change once every three months, every time you do your balance sheet. For the, but between balance sheet changes, nothing changes. So if you did your balance sheet on September 30th of 2008, during the midst of the worst crisis in history, your book value stayed really stable, telling you nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Look the other way. The fact that book value is stable is a problem because the real world is not a stable pace. Everything moves around and you're not even trying. It's true markets screw up, but at least it's trying. You're with this, oh no my god, you're with this. 
So the book value being stable is not a good feature, it's a bad feature. So if that's the reason that's being given, I want my debt ratio to be fixed, let it go. This is not a good reason to use book value. The second reason you'll be given is, hey, we're just being conservative. We're accountants. And I'll tell you in what sense they're telling you they're being conservative. Book value debt ratios for US companies are between 40 to 50 percent. Market value debt ratios are between 15 to 20 percent. You're saying why the big difference? Because the market value of equity is much higher than the book value of equity. So when I use book values, I get much higher debt ratios. You're saying there. That's why we do it, to be conservative. Let's carry this to the next step, though. What do I use these debt ratios for? To compute a cost of capital. And the cost of debt is a much lower number than my cost of equity. In the case of Disney, for instance, my cost of equity is close to 9 percent. My cost of debt is less than 3 percent. So if I weight debt more and I weight equity less, which is what I do with book value, what am I going to do to my cost of capital? I'm going to push it down. In what sense is using a 5.5% cost of capital to decide on take projects, decide on taking projects, better than using an 8 How is it more conservative? So if the argument is I'm being more conservative, it doesn't hold up as well. And the third argument is a very technical one. One of the few places where we use book values is in computing return in equity and return in invested capital for companies, which we then compare to the cost of capital. So accountants say, look, because we're using book values to compute those returns, we should be consistent and use book values here as well, which makes absolutely no sense because my cost of capital is supposed to be an opportunity cost of doing whatever I'm doing today elsewhere in the market. And if I tried to do that, I'd have to do it in market value terms. In short, there is no good reason for using book values, but people continue to use them. You see, what if I have a private company? Even with private companies, and we're going to see this when I get to Bookscape, I'm going to argue book values are useless. I'm going to try to find a way to come up with the market debt ratio even for a private company. So let's talk about getting the market values for debt and equity. Which one's going to be easier to get for Disney? Market value equity is what? Share price times number of shares, right? If you have multiple class of shares, just remember to take the market value of all of the class of shares. So for Google, you have class A, class B, it's the market cap. So that's the easy one. I'll tell you the item where getting market value is more difficult. It's debt. Even for a company like Disney, which has 90% of, of its debt take the form of corporate bonds, where you could conceivably look up the market value of the corporate bonds, there is a slice of the debt, 10%, which is bank loans. Bank loans are not marked to market. They're still at the book value terms. So getting book value of debt is often difficult. So what's the investment banking solution to that difficult problem? What do they, if you work in investment bank and you compute cost of capital, they use market cap, thank God for that, most of the time, for equity. But when it comes to debt, they do a little dance saying it's so difficult to get market value. So here's what we're going to do instead, which is use book value. So often in calculations, you market value of equity, book value of debt. And most of the time, I don't have an issue with, with it because for most companies, market value of debt and, market, uh, and book value of debt are pretty close to each other, except when they're not. When does market value of debt start to deviate significantly from the book value? When you get into distress, your market value of debt can become 40, 30, 20 percent of your book value very quickly. So I'm going to give you a very easy trick to convert book debt to market debt. Remember how to price a bond? Act like you do. It's foundation stuff, you know, it was done way back. How do you price a bond? You take the coupons and the face value, and you discount them back to today using the current market interest rate in the bond. So you take the actual coupons and face value. So as interest rates go up, the price of the bond goes down. I'm going to take that and apply it to all of Disney's debt. So let me lay the foundations. Disney has a lot of debt. They have about $14.288 billion in book debt. So in the balance sheet, that's their book value of debt. So I'm going to act like that's the face value of the debt. It's so the face value of the bond. On their interest expenses, they tell you that their interest expenses are $349 million a year. I'm going to treat that like a coupon. And in the footnotes to their balance sheet, they tell me that debt is going to come due in about 7.9 years. So I'm going to take all of Disney's debt, $14.288 billion face value, $349 million interest expenses, 7.9 year maturity, and treat it like a bond with a face value for, of $14.3 billion, a coupon payment of 
349 million and a maturity of 7.9 years. But you see, you need a market interest rate to discount this stuff back. Now you notice why I sequenced things the way I did? What did we just do? We did a cost of debt for Disney, and we came up with 3.75% based on their synthetic rating. If Disney were borrowing money today, that's what they would have to pay. So I took the 349 million, and I took the present value of the 349 million. If that equation looks mysterious and unfamiliar, this is the price we pay for putting that present value button on your calculator. That is the present value of an annuity. Pre-financial calculators, you actually had to go through this equation. You think, thank God for that. But if, don't be, so if you put in 749 million as your payment, N is 7.9 years, and R is 3.75%, you hit the present value button, you get exactly the same number I get with that equation. It's the present value of my coupons for the next 7.9 years. At the end of the 7.9 years, don't forget, you get the face value back. You discount them all back to today. What I get as a present value is about $13.03 billion. What's the book value? 14.3. I'm replacing it with a market value of $13 billion. You can do this with pretty much any company, right? Book value of debt is right there on the balance sheet, debt outstanding. Interest expenses should be in your income statement. The one tricky thing is getting the maturity of the debt, and most companies will have a footnote that breaks it down. If they don't, then you're kind of sunk. You just have to take the book value as market value. But at least give it a try, because for most companies, you should be able to compute a market value of debt. Now, very quickly, before we leave this, why is my market value of debt lower than my book value? Why does the price of a bond drop below face value? When does it happen? When the market interest rate is higher than your coupon rate, right? What's the equivalent of your coupon rate on this debt? If I take the interest expense of 349 million, divide by the 14.3 billion book value, I get a book interest rate. If the market interest rate is much higher than the book interest rate, guess what you're going to find? You're going to find that the market value of debt is at a discount to book value. If your market interest rate is roughly equal to the book interest rate, you've got the investment banking solution, which is book value of debt is equal to market value of debt. If the market interest rate is much lower than the book interest rate, you could actually get a market value of debt that's much higher. You seldom see that in the U.S. because most debt in the U.S. is callable. You're saying, so what? If interest rates drop a lot, a lot of companies are going to replace their debt with much cheaper debt. In much of the rest of the world, though, where you have bank loans, you could get stuck with interest rates way higher than what you should be paying. Nothing you can do about it, but I'm going to give you a market value of debt that's much, much, much higher than your book value. Now comes the other loose set. That takes care of my interest-bearing debt. It's going to give me a market value. But remember I said lease commitments are debt because they're contractual commitments? Luckily for us, in much of the world, and especially in the U.S., those contractual commitments, even though they're not treated as debt, even through 2018, there was a footnote that told you how much Disney had as lease commitments for the next five years and beyond. So you can find this for pretty much any U.S. company, and most European, most Asian. I mean, it's now global. IFRS required it, so it's part of the, the, the disclosure requirements. To convert those lease commitments to debt, I'm going to do something very simple. To compute the price of a, the market value of debt, what I did, I took the debt payments and I discounted them back to today using my pre-tax cost of debt, right? I'm going to do exactly the same with my lease commitments. I'm going to take the lease commitments that Disney has and discount them each back to today using my pre-tax cost of debt of 3.75%. What I get as my present value of all those commitments put together is about $2.9 billion. I'm going to call that my lease debt. Starting in 2019, that's what accountants are going to be doing with every company. But until now, I've had to do it because the footnotes gave me the commitments. I've converted into debt. That $2.9 billion becomes debt in addition to the $13 billion. See this $15.96 billion? From this point on for the rest of the class, when I talk about Disney's debt, you're going to see $15.96 billion is my debt. When I do cost of capital, when I do debt ratios, from this point on, my debt is going to be based on treating leases as debt as well. Before I leave the lease issue, it's any contractual commitment. So starting in 2019, accountants are going to finally do the right thing on leases. But you know what? It's only the tip of the iceberg. Anybody here doing Netflix for their corporate finance class? Don't worry, I won't ask you specifics. Nobody's doing Netflix. Come on, somebody's doing Netflix. 
if you're not, pick it. It's a fun company to do. Netflix has lease commitments, so the accountant's going to treat lease commitments as debt. But if you go to the footnote table, take, even if you're not doing Netflix, go and take a look at that 10K or annual report. You're going to see a commitment table. You're going to see lease commitments. And right next to it, you're going to see content commitments. Stretching out over time. Big numbers. You know what those commitments are for? How many people here have Netflix? Okay. This is market saturation right here. Yeah. Take a look at, you know, open up Netflix. Don't do it right now when you, you, know, I know you, when you get home. Look, and you see all the, now it's original content. So much of it that I lose track of it, like five new movies every day, you know. But there were a lot of old content, right? Movies from seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. How do they get the right to show these movies? They go to the studios, they sign an agreement saying, you know, for Disney, for instance, you know, one of the problems Disney is going to have with their streaming is they've actually given Netflix a contractual commitment to show, I think, exclusively some of their more recent Star Wars movies. And they can't get them back. So basically, so let's say you enter into a five-year commitment with Disney. Disney says you can show all the Star Wars movies you want if you pay us $500 million a year. Contractual commitment? Absolutely. Tax deductible? Yes. If you fail to pay it, what happens? Hey, you're going to get sued, potentially pushed into bankruptcy. So if you're doing Netflix, you should probably do the same thing. Don't wait for the accountants to do the right thing. We know what to do here. You take those commitments, you discount them back at the cost of debt. You've got your debt value for contractual commitments. One final example, and I use this in my valuation class as well, but might as well use it again. So I remember uh, opening day in 2009. I'm a Yankee fan, new stadium had been built, and I decide that I have to take my kids, they're all at home still, to opening day because they could tell their grandchildren. I was there the first day Yankee Stadium opened. So we go on opening day, we get tickets in the bleachers because that's the most I was willing to pay. I offered this deal to all of my kids, all four of my kids, but I ended up taking only three. My daughter was excluded, not because I was sexist, but the first question she asked me when I said, hey, do you want to go to the Yankee game? She said, will there be dipping Dots there? You know what dipping Dots are? Go to Yankee Stadium, it's a little granules of... I, I said, I have no idea. She said, I'm not going if there are no dipping Dots. I said, I'm not spending half the game looking for a dipping. I don't even know what the new stadium looks like or where the dipping Dots are. And if that's the reason you're coming to the Yankee game, you might as well, I'll get you dipping Dots to eat at home. And you can watch us on TV. So I took my three sons, we sit on the bleachers, and the Yankees run onto the field. And as they ran out of the field, all I could think about was debt and equity. You say, what? You sick. Because here's what I saw. I, got, I saw a guy called Mark Teixeira run to first base. But I didn't see Mark. I saw $23 million a year for the next seven years run to the first base. <laughs> then to second base, you had a guy called Robinson Cano, young. That was my cheap infielder. $10 million for three years. Then I swung around to shortstop. Derek Jeter, legend. Luckily, only four years left on his contract, 15 million a year. Then I looked at third base, and there was an imposter that day. The guy who was supposed to be there was a guy called Alex Rodriguez. And if he'd run out of the field, I'd have passed out. 27 million a year, every year for the next 10 years. On the mound, you had CC Sabathia, just signed to what, a nine year contract, eight year contract. 25 million a year. And behind the plate, you had Jorge Posada, 15 million a year for three years. I didn't do this while I was in the game because I thought it was inappropriate. When I got home, I computed the present value of contractual <laughs> commitments in the Yankee infield. I'll send you a picture. It was 600. I forget about it. say, what about the outfield? Who cares about the outfield at that point in time? They were all cheap outfielders, rented for a year. The infield alone was $661 million in commitments. If baseball is not your thing, you love soccer. Next time AC Barker runs onto the field, compute present value of commitments, it'll freak you out. You look at sports teams, you know, you think the only defense that soccer teams I have is we can sell players, which is kind of, it makes me a little queasy to think about buying and selling players and you now bring back visions of controlling these. But at least there, there is some escape hatch. But my point is, this is not just about leases. This is a much bigger issue. 
that we've got to deal with and think about this being part of that. So when you, when you, here's what I'd like you to do for your company. Get your cost of equity, get your cost of debt, get the market value of equity. And remember, if you have multiple class of shares to count them all, and try to get a market value of debt. If you really give up and use book value, I'm, I'm okay with that, but I want you to try to get a market value of debt. And check your footnotes to see if you have contractual commitments. And if you have contractual commitments, bring them on as debt. Come up with a debt ratio, because here's where we're leading. I have a debt ratio for Disney based on the market value of equity and the market value of debt. The market value of equity is share price and the number of shares. This is a page that the last 100 slides have been leading up to. So help me out here. Why am I using a 2.75% risk free rate? Because I'm doing Disney in US dollars. That is the T bond rate. I'm using that as my risk free rate. The beta 1.0013 came from where? That is my bottom up beta. Five businesses, levered beta, all that work paid off. I have a beta. The risk premium of 5.76% reflects the fact that Disney gets 82% of its revenues in the US, 18% is a weighted average. Cost of equity of 8.5%. Cost of debt we just went through, right? Risk-free rate plus a default spread based on the actual rating. The tax rate is 36.1%, cost of debt of 2.4%. Disney is about 88.4% equity, 11.6% debt. My weighted average of those two numbers gives me a cost of capital of 7.81%. So, so it takes work to get there. Nothing in here is complicated, but there are lots of details to nail down. In fact, with Disney, I could go the extra step because I'd broken them down by business to do my bottom up betas. I actually computed cost of capital by business, by division. You see the cost of capital for each of the divisions reflecting different betas and different debt ratios. Okay. With Vale, again, I could compute a cost of capital both in US dollar terms and nominal REI terms. So once you get the cost of equity and cost of debt, you can go crazy. You can slice and dice your company. You can come up with cost of capital by country, by division. You have the tools you need to essentially compute the cost of capital for pretty much any individual investment. Sorry. My mopping up the three other companies, because I treated them as single business companies, I computed only one cost of capital. For Tata Mortis to stay consistent with the fact that I'm doing everything in rupees, I took a weighted average of cost of equity in rupees, cost of debt in rupees, which I computed based on the synthetic rating. Cost of capital of 12.15%. Buy, don't remember, cost of capital is very close. And this is why I said let's not spend too much time on Baidu's rating. It's 5% debt, 95% equity. It's predominantly an equity funded company. Does it really matter whether the Triple A rating is actually a single A rating. It's not going to affect the cost of capital very much. And finally, for Bookscape, I computed two costs of capital. One used the market beta, which assumes investors are diversified. I get 6.57%. So Bookscape were part of a publicly traded company or held by a diversified investor, the cost of capital would be 6.57%. But Bookscape is held by an owner who is not diversified. For that, for that owner, I estimate a much higher cost of capital. And this is what we talked about in the last session, about how private business owners face this problem up front, competing with publicly traded companies, because they face much higher discount rates for any given level of risk, because they can't diversify away that risk. You have a break in front of you. I know you're planning great things. Try to get your cost of capital for your company nailed down, right? The process is, and you're welcome to use my betas by sector. I don't want you to spend your time doing grunt work. You can use my ratings estimator. You plug in the numbers. This is not, but I can automate. In fact, I have the entire project in an automated spreadsheet. We enter the numbers from, Bloom, from the, in the first slide. Everything gets computed all the way through. And I'll give it to you at the end of the class. You're welcome to use it. This is not about doing the numbers. Numbers are pretty mechanical and straightforward. It's about reading those numbers and understanding what those numbers mean for you as a company. One final point before we leave this part of the class. What do we, what, remember the box that we were started coming up with a hurdle rate, right? That's basically what all of these last 14 sessions, or last 12 sessions, 11 sessions, whatever it is, have been about coming up with a hurdle rate. But at this stage, if you're puzzled about hurdle rates, I don't blame you, because I've talked about two different hurdle rates. One is a cost of equity, 
and the other is a cost of capital. You think, how can they both be hurdle rates? They're different numbers. So I'll give you the rule. It, right now it's going to sound abstract, but when I start to look at projects, you're going to see why I create this rule. If your returns are returns to equity, returns to equity investors, your hurdle rate should be a cost of equity. So if you're talking about cash flows to equity, returns in equity, the hurdle rate is a cost of equity. If your returns are to the entire firm, your cash flows are before debt payments, your hurdle rate is the cost of capital. You don't get to pick and choose which hurdle rate you can use because it depends on how you computed your returns in the first place. As I said, it sounds like an abstraction, but we'll come back and flesh it out when we talk about actual projects. So it took us a long time, but we got one box nailed down. <laughs> the hurdle rate should reflect the riskiness of your investment. So remind me again how we measure riskiness. If you're a publicly traded company, we measure risk as risk you cannot diversify away and bring into the cost of equity, and as default risk and we bring it into the cost of debt, and should reflect the mix of debt and equity. How did that come into your hurdle rate? When we did the cost of capital, the weights we used were the mix of debt and equity. So we got a hurdle rate. Let's move on to the other half of the equation. What's the investment principle? You want to take projects that earn a return that is greater than your minimum acceptable hurdle rate. So I'm going to give you the theme song that's going to drive the next part of the discussion. When we think about returns, I'm reminded of my favorite line from one of my favorite movies, <coughs> Jerry Maguire. I think it's Cuba Gooding Jr. Is it Cuba Gooding Jr.? Is it, I think he says, no, he's uh, talking about a contract. He says, show me the money. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, show me the accounting earnings. <laughs> He didn't say, show me the operating profits. He said, show me the money. This is a very direct process. You can play all the games you want about earnings, but returns have to be based on cash flows. So I'm going to start off with the question of what's so different about cash flows? Why do earnings and cash flows vary for companies? I'm not an accountant, and every morning I get up, I get down on my knees, I look up at the sky, and say, thank you, God. But I'm glad there are accountants around to supply raw data for me. But when I think about, about accounting, looking at it from the outside, there seem to be two broad principles that drive how accountants think about numbers. The first is the notion of accrual accounting. What does accrual accounting require you to do? Record transactions as they happen. So if you sell something on December 30th, you have to show it as revenues this year, even though you haven't been paid for it yet. And you have to then trace out all the expenses associated with those revenues and, and post them as expenses, even though you might not have paid for the, those expenses, you might have payments due next year. You think, what other choice do I have? Here's a much more honest way of doing accounting. It's called cash accounting, checkbook accounting. Now you do checkbook accounting? You record revenues as you get paid. You record expenses, you pay them. I use checkbook accounting when I do my income taxes, but that's because I'm not a corporation. If you're a company, you have to do accrual accounting. File that away, say, who cares? It's going to come back. The second is accountants have this fixation about classifying expenses into three boxes. My first accounting professor actually made this literally. He brought three cardboard boxes and said, let me show you what the expenses look like. The first box he labeled operating expense. He said, any expense that creates a benefit only in the current year, I'm going to put in the operating expense box, labor, material. The second box he labeled capital expense. He said, any expense that creates benefit over many years, I'm going to put in the capital expense box, land, equipment, machinery. And the third box he called financial expenses. Any expense associated with the use of debt, I'm going to put in the third box, mostly just interest expenses. He said, we're religious in accounting about classifying expenses. I know enough accounting then to contest him, but we know accountants are not that religious about putting items in the right boxes. We've already talked about one item they've routinely miscategorized for much of their life, which is leases, right? They've kept putting it in the operating expense box. Now, finally, they're going, this is not going to be a big issue in this class, but when you get to valuation, you know another expense they routinely miscategorized? What did I say capital expense was? expense over many years. You're a technology firm, you're a pharmaceutical firm, your big capex is really R&D and they throw it in the So let's let that slip. Let's assume that they're religious. You've got three. The reasons earnings can be different from cash flows are because of those two accounting principles. In fact, if I give you accounting earnings on a project or a company and you want to get to cash flows, it's very simple. There are three adjustments you have to make. First, 
Remember that capital expense, so because those expenses each have a place to go. Operating expenses go into your income statement right below revenues. How do account accountants record capital expenses? They show them as assets and then depreciate them over time. And financial expenses show up below the operating income line. Nice and neat. So if I give you earnings on a project or a company to get to cash flows, first thing you're going to do is add back your depreciation and amortization. When I say depreciation, from this point on, when I say depreciation, why don't you guys just in your mind say, and it gets so tedious, depreciation. No. So I'll just say depreciation. Add back those non-cash charges. Why am I doing that? Because even though they're expenses, they're not cash expenses. Nobody writes a check out to depreciation. If you do, let me know. I'm willing to change my name. The motor in depreciation, close enough. Think of the billions I could collect, right? I'm depreciation. I'm, you know. So I add it back because it's not a cash expense. Then I subtract out capex. Why do I subtract out capex? You go buy some land. You tell the guy, I, don't, I can't pay for the land. It's a capital expense. You're not owning the land. You're going to pay for it. Capital, who cares? The guy wants cash now. So whatever the accountants call it, I've got to spend. It's a cash outflow. I subtract out. Then I subtract out change in working capital. You know how many generations of people do valuation who do this line item? And you ask them, why do we do it? They have no idea. It's always done. You know why we do it? It's because your numbers are accrual accounting numbers, and you want to make them cash numbers. Let's go back. What I say happens when you sell something on December 30th? You have to show it as revenues this year, even though you haven't been paid for it yet. But because you haven't been paid for it, what do you have to show on your balance sheet? You have to show accounts receivable. And when you haven't paid for something, you have to show accounts payable. When you use items from the previous year, you have to show inventory. Working capital is a residue of accrual accounting. And if I want to make my accrual income into cash income, I've got to take the change in that working capital. Income plus depreciation minus capex minus change in working capital is my cash flow. So let me ask you a question. Can you have a company with huge positive earnings and negative cash flows? Absolutely. What has to be true for the company? Remember the three adjustments got to be, what is it? Large capex alone will not do it because most companies with large capex also usually have large depreciation. You have to have large capex and small depreciation. When would that happen? If you're a growing company because your depreciation reflects your past, your capex reflects your current. So you could have large positive earnings and negative cash flows. Can you have the reverse? Can you have large negative earnings and positive cash flows? It's a dream of every private business in Latin America and Asia. We're losers. We're willing to be losers. What's the big benefit of reporting negative income? You don't pay taxes, but you deposit. Would you be willing to be classified a loser if I let you deposit $5 million in the bank every year? I would. I don't care. I'm cash in. And I remember Jerry Maguire. Show me the money. So my point is earnings and cash flows can be different numbers. And when they're different, what am I saying? Trust the cash flows. So let me defend this, because accountants will push back. You cannot spend earnings. Try. Walk over to that, that star, the quasi-Starbucks across the street. Be willing to stand in the light for like two hours. If you want to really, if you want to save time, just walk to Broadway. That Starbucks is usually empty. Okay? Walk to the front. Order a venti cappuccino. Don't go special uh, soy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Let's make it simple. Venti cappuccino. $5.62 is some crappy price. Offer to pay with earnings. Say, look, I'm in the MBA program at Stern. I have a good you know, future earnings stream coming. Could I give you an IOU? And, unless you have a really stupid cashier, he or she's going to say, that's nice, but I need to see cash or a credit card. You can't spend earnings. You can only spend cash. And if you're ever tempted to trust accounting earnings, I have two words for you. Winston Groom. You have no idea what I'm talking about, right? You heard of Winston Groom? He, used to, he write, wrote some books, most of which nobody read or very few people read. In the mid-'80s, he wrote a book called Forrest Gump that some guy at Paramount read and said, this would make a good movie. So he comes to you know, Winston and he says, look, we'd like to make a movie out of your book. Winston is very flattered. Somebody wants to make And they offer him a contract. He takes a look at the contract. It entitles him to 15% of the accounting profits on this movie. Mistake number one. 
There's a little footnote that says accounting profits will be use, computed using studio accounting standards. Mistake number two. He signs a contract. Mistake number three. Movie gets made, not a mistake. It becomes this huge hit with Tom Hanks as a star. It's made 50 million, 100 million, becomes one of the 10 highest grossing movies of all time. And poor Winston's at home waiting for the check and it doesn't come and it doesn't come and so maybe they lost my address. She calls Paramount and says, where's my 15%? There's a 15% of what? The money you're making on this movie. They say, we're losing lots of money on this movie. So how can you be losing money? He said, come in and look at our books. They look at the books. Sure enough, they're reporting a $50 million loss on a $250 million gate receipts. And he looks at the line items and there's an expense item for $150 million. He said, what is that? That's a provision. <laughs> for what? We haven't named it, but it's for future bad movies. <laughs> Studio accounting actually allows you to take a portion of your successful movies and you, this actually explains some phenomenon you've been struggling with, like all those Eddie Murphy movies that came out. Maybe this provision gets really big and you say, I have to make three, three really bad movies in the next month. Eddie's free, what can we do? Okay. So given, and, and that's the reason. If you look at it, Winston Groom basically sued. He won nothing. And to give you a contrast, and this will be the last thing. You know what Steven Spielberg's contracts are specified as a percentage of? Gate receipts. He's actually behind the cashier saying, 15, I'll take my 5% right there. Because <laughs> he doesn't want the accountants in the room. Because once they come in, all heck breaks loose. So given a choice between earnings and cash flows, we're going to go with the cash flows. And next session, we're going to talk about applying. So when we come back from the break, we'll talk about applying this for projects. So making both problems worse, right? By taking the money out of the company, they're making them something even more over levered, yeah. and they're not taking any profit. Right. So if you're an over levered firm, you're affected in two levels. Because when you pay the cash out, you're not paying down your debt or taking profit. So you're affecting yourself on two negative fronts. Yeah. Yeah. If you're under levered and you do a buyback, at least you're fixing one half of your problem. Your under levered will become more correctly levered. So you, maybe you're not taking projects, but to me the damage seems to be far less. Yeah, but, but that's more a risky uh, vision of the, the problem. It's not like... Uh, no, no, even the, from the perspective, if you think about a company being run optimally, a company that's run optimally is funded right, is taking the right project, is paying the right amount of dividends. So basically I've made, I've taken the dividend equation, I've taken the other two and I've jumbled them up, right? Yeah. So these companies are not taking the right projects, they're not correctly leveled. Some are under leveled, some are over leveled, some but, are too many. But the many. over leveraged company, sometimes they are not making cash. Let's no, but, the fa the, but, but it's, cash, it's irrelevant, because that. in this case, it's a buyback, right? So if you're doing a buyback, yeah. Yeah, it's coming out of the company. So to, any, to the degree that they're doing any buybacks, it's actually cash that they should not be returned. Yeah. Okay? So the question of whether they have cash or not becomes irrelevant. If you buy buybacks and they don't have the cash, it doesn't affect them anyway. And if they choose to do buybacks, now the law is going to stop them saying, hey, you can't do buybacks. That, that, that cash should be used to either pay down debt mm -hmm. or take projects or preferably both. 